Okay. Hey, I think we're live. Hello. Okay, so if you don't know, this is a live stream. I think I'm going to jam for just a minute, for a couple minutes while people come in. Uh, yeah, this is going to be fun. I'm really excited about this. This is going to be a real chill conversation about a musical concept that I think is often misunderstood, but really interesting. So we'll talk about that, and then we'll talk about whatever you want to. So if you have questions about any bass or music-related thing, throw them in the chat. Uh, so I'm just going to play for a minute or two while people come in and then we'll get started. So thanks for being here. And I'm just, I think this is gonna be fun. So here we go. Here's a, I'll just jam for a minute and then we'll talk about fun music things. And uh, while you're coming into the chat, tell me where you're from and what's your daily driver base? What's your main base? Mike, nice. Virginia Beach. I used to play there. And Fender Vintage 2. Awesome. Yeah, while you're coming into the chat, tell me where you are in the world and what your daily driver base is. I'm just jamming for a second while people come in, and then we're just going to open up this discussion. So thanks for being here. get started here that was fun also by the way this base is for you if you want this base I'm giving it away so in the description to this video there's a giveaway link and Thursday I'm gonna announce who won it and it's a really great little base I did this video doing a bunch of Mustang base shootouts last week and uh, this one did really, really well, despite being one of the cheaper ones. I was really impressed with it. Um, so hello, everyone. Welcome. Welcome to the chat. I can see the chat right next to the camera. So if I'm looking there, I'm reading the chat, and there's you in the camera. I'm just excited to do this. This is something uh, I just kind of threw together today because I'm really excited about something I'm going to do next week, which is going to be a live Zoom educational class. Um, so I'm just kind of like getting the whole live stream thing together. I haven't done it in a while because I had a I had an old, old MacBook that just couldn't do it, and the internet here wasn't fast enough. But guess what? Now I have fiber here, hardlined, and I want to try and figure this whole thing out so that I can do live streams more consistently. So this is, if you're here, this is a surprise and you are, uh, you just timed it just right that you happened to get on YouTube while I went live. I'm just glad you're here. So this is going to be fun. We're going to talk about the pocket. But before I start, I'm just reading the chat here. Hello to everyone. Texas, Virginia Beach, Southern California, Boston. France, 
made in Japan precision. I love Japanese bases. Savannah, Georgia. I was just there last week on a gig with Sam Birchfield. I just did a uh, a, a vlog about that. If you want to check it out, I love Savannah. Brazil, watchmaker. I didn't know you're from Brazil. I really want to go there one day. I've never been to Brazil, and I've heard lovely things. Canada. Designed by Shay. My wife is in the chat. Hello, lovely designed by Shay. Also in Atlanta. Just two rooms over there. Serbia. Southern California. Okay, well, just keep them coming. Let me know where you are and what base you play. What's your daily driver? My daily driver is, uh, I have a few, but for gigging, it's this JMJ with uh, some swapped out pickups. Maybe we'll talk about that later. So basically the way this live stream is gonna work today is I am going to talk about this topic, the pocket, what it is, how do you find it? It's I think it's a misunderstood musical concept um, that means different things to different people. So we'll talk about that and then I'll open it up for questions. So if you have a question, it doesn't have to be about the pocket, but it could be. Um, so I'll go for a few minutes about the pocket and then we'll talk about whatever you want to and we'll kind of go back and forth between this like very loose structure, loose plan versus whatever you want to talk about. Uh, and we can just open it up. So first off, what is the pocket? I feel like that's a term that gets thrown around a lot and it's something that doesn't necessarily mean the same thing to everyone. My take is the pocket, well, I think there's four levels of understanding of, of the pocket, what it means. I'll talk about the first two first. So the first most one-dimensional understanding of what the pocket is, is just your sense of time. Can you play to a metronome? Can you play and lock into the grid? Can you just execute accurate timing? And that's what some people mean when they say the pocket. But I think that's probably the worst, maybe not worst, but I think that's the, the most one-dimensional understanding of the pocket. That one's pretty straightforward. Can you play in time? Can you play with a metronome? How is your accuracy? How is your sonic accuracy? Pretty straightforward. So let's go to the next level. So that was level one. Level two is how you sit in a groove. And those are two different things. How you sit in time versus how you sit in a groove. How accurate you are versus your groove are different things. How do we quantify that? It reminds me of a few years ago. Watch your ears. I'm just moving this mic over so I can get a little closer. So a few years ago, more than a few years ago, it's probably 10 years ago now, I had a gig and I was pretty green. I was just out of music school. I've been practicing a lot. I was really excited to just try and make my way out in the world as a musician. And I had a gig with a drummer that I really looked up to and admired. This drummer is probably 10 or 15 years older than me. Um, he was in off a major tour with a major artist and was doing this gig that I happened to be on. So I really practiced hard and I did my best and the gig went fine. And after the gig, I asked the drummer respectfully, I said, Hey, I really, I have respect for you. I want to get to the next level with my musicianship. What do I need to work on? And we just played a, a proper hour long gig um, with an original artist. And what he said to me gracefully, he said, um, you did fine. Your chops are good. You need to work on your pocket. And what he meant, he didn't mean you need to work on your timing. He was saying you need, and maybe not even work on your groove necessarily, what he was saying is you need to work on your maturity, your musical maturity and how you sit in the groove. And that's where we come to a concept that I like to call the three T's. There's your timing, there's your taste, and there's your tone. And those three things together, those three T's, I think determine if you're in the pocket or not. If you're sonically accurate with your timing, and then the second thing, the thing that I was missing at the time was the taste, the taste being your decisions. This has to do with your maturity. This has to do with you choosing to play or to not play something. And then not just if you're going to do it, but where choosing the moments. So it's not just your sense of 
time, but it's your sense of timing. Where do you do the thing and if you do the thing? That's your taste. Having restraint or confidence or nuance. So see the difference? It's not just your sense of time, how well you can keep time. It's that combined with how you sit in an ensemble, how you sit in a groove, how you can have the restraint to not play something. And I think a good rule of thumb is if you have an idea that comes to you, if you execute that idea, will it make the music groove more or less? And if you can make that call in that moment and choose to not do that thing, if it's going to make the groove groove less, that's your taste. See the difference? So layer one is how's your timing? Layer two is how's your timing and your taste and your tone? I think tone's a part of it too. You have to have a, a sound, a nice fat sound that's going to work with the ensemble. Because this is about sitting in the groove, sitting in the mix, sitting in the song, being able to sit with a band. So those are two different things. And those are the first two layers to the pocket. Um, I want to know what you think about the pocket. I'm going to, I'm excited about layers three and four. We'll come back to that in a minute. Uh, we'll come back to that in a minute. In the meantime, I want to open it up for questions. So let me know if you have a specific question. It doesn't have to be about the pocket. We'll come back to that in a minute. Um, hello, everybody. I'm just, I'm going back and forth between my mind and the chat. <laughs> so I'm catching up on the, the comments. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks for jumping in. This is super last minute. I want to try and do these more consistently. Uh, hello, Nancy. Nancy is a friend of mine from the Netherlands. Um, after watching your recent video, I bought a Classic Vibe 60s Mustang bass. It arrived an hour ago. Congratulations, Mark. I hope you love it. And speaking of, like I said earlier, this one, this is the one that was in the video Mark's referring to. And this is going to be given away. So if you're interested in getting this specific bass that's in my hands, I think it sounds pretty good. This is for you. The link is in the description for the giveaway. The giveaway will be announced on Thursday. Uh, so if you want this bass, go enter. I hope that you win. And also too, I hate to say this, but there is a scammer that is pretending to be me and I keep deleting their comments and they're lying to people and saying, uh, hey, you have to pay shipping, S send me your credentials. The, if the only way I will communicate to the winner is through email and I will pay shipping personally. So that is a lie. So if you see that person, delete them or uh, report them or whatever, it will be announced. Uh, I will send the email to the winner and then I'll announce it on a live stream and I'm planning to go live on Thursday of next week. So please do not be deceived by this nefarious person. Um, it's kind of a new thing to me to deal with people like that as this channel begins to grow, but all of you in this chat are lovely humans, and uh, I just, I'm just glad that you're here. So, um, okay, here's a great question from Wilson. Hey man, I was wondering how to handle a new drummer who can't play with a bass player. I think this is relevant, this is relevant to this discussion. We might dig a little deeper into this later, um, but I think, how to handle them. I think this has to do with your strength, your, your, your strength as a musician, your confidence and your own internal clock strength, if that makes sense. You have to be able to have the confidence and ability to play with someone that's not playing well. How do you do that? And sometimes it's painful, but you have to just lock into your own memory of the song and your own sense of timing and choose to almost like ignore what they're doing, which I hate to do because music should be a conversation, right? But sometimes I do, I'll deal with this where I'm dealing with a drummer that is not solid. You know, it almost feels like you're dragging them along, which no one likes, but you know, it's okay. We're all learning, right? We're all at different places in our journey. I think what you need to do is you need to do your homework beforehand, which is building your rhythmic 
mind, confidence, interdependence. Uh, and I think we'll talk about that a little later in the chat, how to have that dependence, how to have that confidence with your own internal clock. There's a couple exercises that I will share with you. Um, but it's hard. There's not a reason, there's not an easy answer to that because, I mean, we all love playing with great drummers, right, as bass players, but it's not always the case. So I know that question isn't fully answered, but I will come back to answer that more fully, maybe a little later in the chat. It was a great question. Um, I'm catching up on the chat here. Good insight, Alan. We're getting some string information from Jim. Thank you. Oh, wow. Great, great question there from Puck Jones. What do you find to be the most helpful exercises, activities, experiences to build feel and skill in each of the T's? Okay. Wow, great question. So the three T's, if you're just coming in, we talked about this a minute ago, the three T's uh, is something I like to call uh, the elements that make up your pocket, three of them. The main ones being your timing, your taste, and your tone. Um, I think we could talk in depth about each of those T's, but the one thing that will grow all three of your stats on those respective T's there's one thing that will do all of them, and that is listening. Listening to great music. Listening to excellent recordings of great musicians. Because when you're doing that, you're hearing all three of those T's executed, and you're starting to internalize those concepts. You'll hear great taste, you'll hear, you'll hear great tone, and you will hear the timing of how each musician is sitting in the ensemble. So it's almost like eating vegetables for your for your pocket, listening to music. And then once you listen and internalize, then pick up your instrument and try and by ear recreate what they're doing. I think that's a great way to grow your pocket and grow all three of your T's. We could talk in depth about each of the T's, but I think that's the one that would do all three. So, um, uh, Jim has some questions about strings. Wow, there's a lot of great questions. I'm not gonna be able to do everything. Um, thank you, Loopy. There are flat ones that come stock on the JMJ. Uh, <laughs> yes, Phil does use Diderio. I think that's how you say it, half rounds. That is accurate. Labellas are great. I agree with that as well. Um, I get a lot of questions about strings. And I will say, if I'm using rounds, I'm using string joy strings. If I'm using flats, I'm probably using labellas. And if I'm using half wound strings, I'm using dederias. And I find, personally, that half rounds are a sweet spot on the Mustang. I think Mustangs, they can come off as harsh in a mix. Um, they have a lot of low-end information. They have a lot of high-end information. They're sort of scooped. So taming that top end, I find strings can help with that. Um, the JMJ comes with flats. I love a Mustang with flats. And actually, I will say, the reason I started going to half rounds is because um, I was doing a session uh, the Roofman session in Germany a couple years ago, and I was I was doing this recording session. We were recording a tape. I was um, Rhett Scholl was also on this gig, and the arrangements we were coming up with these sort of like indie rock, uh, lots of thick sort of sounds. And I was finding that the JMJ wasn't cutting as much as I wanted it to, and I switched to those half rounds halfway through the session. And when I did. The engineer and the uh, producer sort of lit up when we listened to playback and said, this is working better. Um, so it was just evidence that that was successful in that context. So if I were you and you have a Mustang or any bass, I would try all three. And it might be a song by song thing. So.
so um, I'm going to get back to the pocket. This is fun. I'm so glad that all of you are here. And I'm trying to look and see how many of you are here. I just built out my live stream situation here, so bear with me. Nice. I'm so glad you're here. Okay, I'm going to I'm going to talk for a minute or two about the pocket. And then we'll get back to the chat. Um bear with my multitasking challenges here. It's there's a lot going on with the live stream. Um so we talked earlier and, and by the way, come up with questions, have your questions in mind. I'm going to open it up again for questions here in a minute or two. Um so we talked earlier if you're just coming in about there's, in my belief, there are four layers of understanding the pocket and what it is. And that term can mean different things to different musicians. So we talked earlier about um, the first layer being like, it's just your timing. It's can you play accurately? Can you play to a click? Can you play with a decent sense of time? That's the most one dimensional basic version of what the pocket is. The next layer, when someone says play in the pocket, is can you sit in a groove which to sit in a groove it requires more than just accuracy it also requires maturity it requires uh, what i call the three t's you need your timing which is the first layer but then you also need taste you need to choose or to not choose uh, your musical ideas in a way that supports the music and you also need tone in my opinion i think tone is part of your pocket you need to not just sit in the rhythmic groove, but your tone that you bring to the table needs to also sit in the sonic groove. So it's basically a term, a catch-all term for how are you sitting in, in with the groove of the band. Okay, so those are the first two layers of pocket. Timing, and then timing, taste, and tone. How you sit in a groove. So let's go to layer three. And this is where it starts to get a little more interesting. Um, I'm going to use a metaphor that I, I am borrowing from an educator named Joseph Patrick Moore, who's an Atlanta-based player that I admire very much. And uh, he wrote an article years ago about the pocket and what it is. And I'm going to use his example. So imagine that we are in a canoe, okay? We're going down a river or a stream in a canoe. We are flowing along, and there's two people in this canoe right? We're going down together in this canoe, right? Who's going faster? Well, actually, they're going the same speed, right? But one of them, the person in the front of the canoe, is going to arrive at the destination before the person in the back of the canoe, even though they're going the same speed. So if we use that metaphor for music, it's like oftentimes it's the bassist and the the drummer, but it could be anyone in the ensemble. It could be the guitar player. Uh, everyone will sit in time differently as we go down the canoe. We go down the stream of time. The band is um, all sitting in the canoe. Everyone might be sitting in a different place in the canoe. So that's where you get this concept of like in front of or behind the beat. And sometimes this is a genre specific thing sometimes this is an individual specific thing like for example uh in swing music and in jazz music the upright bass player the quarter note is just so on top of the beat like just plowing forward and almost dragging the band along over their shoulder um and i think of motown james jamerson who came from playing swing music and the upright bass player jazz bass player um you listen to motown and it's almost like the bass is just dragging the whole band along with them. Uh, James Jamerson's time feel, he's just plowing ahead. He's not rushing, there's a difference, right? There's a difference between slowing down or speeding up or sitting on top or sitting behind. And that's where that canoe example comes to mind. You're not going faster, you're just slightly ahead of everyone else. And that feeling that is created by that rhythmic uh, separation can create a sort of feeling, a sort of groove of itself where you sit in time, right? Uh, or on the flip side, you can think of more modern music and some funk music where like, I think about Pino Palladino on the D'Angelo records where he's like so far sitting in the back of the canoe that it's about to tip over, right? So 
So these things can be genre specific. They can be individual specific. They can have, everyone has a different time feel based on their influences. Um, and it might be a song by song thing. It might be a section of a song to section of a song thing, right? So that's the third layer. It's where you sit in the canoe, where you sit in the, in time itself as time goes by. Um, so that's the third layer. And then the fourth layer, uh, this is maybe, I don't go off the rails here too much, but it's the concept of within a measure this is most easily demonstrated with drummers because you can have within a measure itself, you can stretch time inside of that measure. Right, so maybe beat four or the and of four is slightly displaced or behind, or beats two and four are a little behind, and you can start to get this like really funky behind, just like fat, deep pocket feel from drums. A lot of that has to do with drummers intentionally creating a hypnotic thing where they're displacing the beat within the measure itself and it's consistent. So if we were going to use that example with our canoe, it's almost like we're going down the, the river in the canoe, going this way, but every few seconds you lean forward or lean back while the canoe is moving steadily. So it's creating like a rhythmic stretching within a measure itself. And that's part of what can give you that really heavy thing. And drummers do that a lot in certain genres. And then bass players can also stretch with the drummer to create and accentuate that feeling, right? So. To recap, the four layers of understanding the pocket. How's your time? That's layer one. Layer two, that is how you sit in a groove itself. So it has to do with your maturity, your decision making, as well as your accuracy. So it's the three T's. It's the timing, the taste, and the tone, and how you sit in a groove based off of your decisions and your ability to keep time. And then the next layer is where you sit within time itself. So the canoe metaphor, are you ahead, are you behind, and being aware of that. And then finally, this concept of stretching time itself within a measure or within multiple measures, intentionally displacing beats where your grid is not surgical and accurate. Your grid, your grid is maybe morphed slightly in an intentional way. And that's where it can get really interesting and get fun, but the trick is you have to remember, go back to the three T's. Use your taste when you're doing this stuff. Um, as you start to explore the pocket and stretching time itself, it can be really fun, but you can stretch time too far and you can do it in a way that is not tasteful. So remind yourself always with great power comes great responsibility. If you're going to do anything, don't do it because you can do it because the music needs it, right? So those are the four layers of understanding the pocket, in my opinion. And I'd love to hear what you all think about the pocket. And I'm going to open up for questions here. So throw your questions in the chat. We'll come back to uh, the pocket in a minute. I'm going to catch up on the chat. Uh, I'm so glad all of you are here. Thank you for joining me. I should say. Um, I have to be better about promoting things. One week from today, October 27th, 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, I am going to do something totally new. The first time I'm going to do a live educational class. It's going to be a creative baseline writing workshop. Uh, and I'm really excited about it. So if you're interested in that, you can sign up for it now. And because you're in this chat, there is a, a discount code for you. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to paste the link here. Stand by. Let's see if it's in the chat there. Okay. There's the link. I just put it in the chat. And also my lovely wife designed by Shay just posted it. And like she says, um, all caps community will get you 33% off. That's something I really want to lean into on this channel because I'm starting to get a sense 
a real sense of community from people that are a part of this channel. And that means a lot to me. I don't want to just be some YouTube dude that has opinions. Like I really, I want to connect with real people. I want to try and help people. I want to have us help each other. Um, I want to do more community stuff like this, like live streams where we talk about, we talk together, we talk about what you want to. Um, and on this live workshop is about that. I want to actually, it's weird doing YouTube where it's like you talk to a camera and you don't see faces and I'm excited to see your faces and like, we'll do, I'll do a lesson thing at the top and then we'll open it up and work together. And that's something that I'm really looking forward to. So that's next Friday, uh, at 3 PM Eastern standard time. So I really encourage you to check that out, sign up for that. This will be the first one, hopefully of many, but if you want to be at the first one, check it out. The link is in the chat there. Uh, and then also I have my four string fundamentals course, which is a pre-recorded thing. I'm talking about two things. There's a live thing next Friday, and then there's a class that is pre-recorded uh, for string fundamentals. There's also a code for that community, same code, all caps community. That'll get you 33% off of either of those. And both of those are in the link in the description. And that's the way you can support this channel. I'm trying to really take this channel seriously and grow it. And those are ways that can really, really help me. Um, so now that the shameless plug is out of the way, I'm catching up on the chat here. Um, Jeff, I'm so glad you find this helpful. Um, ooh, great question. Ryan Logan, do you find yourself counting beats in your head more or listening for cues while playing? Um, it depends. I think there was a time where I counted a lot more in my mind than I do now. I think that's a good thing to do. It's a good place to start. Um, sometimes it depends on your drummer. I feel like sometimes you have drummers that are hard to, <laughs> we were talking about difficult drummers earlier, what to do. Sometimes all you can do is hang on and count and be the authority of the one, know where the one is at all times, especially when drummers are taking solos and they're stretching and trying to, it almost feels like, you ever go tubing behind a boat when like somebody's dad is trying to throw you off a tube on a lake? That's what it feels like when you play with some drummers when they take a solo where you're like, I have no idea where the one is. What do you do? You can't lose the one. And sometimes all you can do is count one, two, three, four, or whatever the, the meter is <laughs> and hang on for dear life. And um, I find too, like tapping your foot with that quarter note can help in those difficult situations. But more often than not, these days, I find myself playing with really good drummers where I don't have to worry about that so much. Um, so I'm usually not counting unless there's some sort of like open time thing where I have to know exactly where one is, where it wouldn't be natural to feel it. But that's a really good question. Um, okay. Another great question here. You guys have great questions. Thank you for being here and thank you for, for asking. Um, this is so much fun. I'm gonna try and do this more regularly. I'm definitely gonna do one, planning to do one Thursday, another YouTube live stream, and then Friday we'll be on Zoom. And to get that link, you have to sign up through the link in the chat, the Teachable link, um, which I'm gonna paste again. The code community for 33% off. Uh, so Thursday will be a live stream. That's where we're going to announce the giveaway for this base. If you want this base, the link is in the description for the giveaway. Friday will be the live uh, Zoom course, and it's going to be about writing creative bass lines. Um, so back to the chat. How do you recommend practicing being ahead of the beat in it or behind the beat? It's a very good question. I think before you can start to practice this concept, um, you have to build your own internal clock and you have to be uh, surgical. I think if we use the canoe metaphor earlier of like a drummer being ahead and the bass player behind or vice versa going down the stream in a canoe, I think before you can do that, you have to think of it like a paddleboard, right? Where instead of two people going like this, they're next to each other going 
burying time together where there's no or very little push or pull against the beat against each other. You have to build your, you have to eat your vegetables and kind of be able to like hold down the right in the middle thing first. And I think that's putting in some reps with the metronome. And uh, shortly I'll show you some examples on how to grow your rhythmic thing, uh, your rhythmic clock, your internal interdependence, rhythmic interdependence with some metronome exercises. Um, and then also, like I said, listening, listen to the greats do it. Uh, different genres, even different bands and different studios have different pockets and you can sort of listen to them. Like right now, recently I've been listening to a ton of Memphis soul music and, um, I love Donald Duck Dunn's playing. It's great cooking music. When my wife and I are cooking in the kitchen, I, I put on Memphis soul music cause it just sounds like cooking in, for some reason. Um, but there's a very specific time feel with Memphis Soul versus Motown. They feel different, right? Versus Muscle Shoals versus more modern stuff like all the D'Angelo stuff and like the more modern stuff like jazz has like all of these different genres have different time feels. So listening to them, you can start to recognize them. That's another great way. So building your own internal clock and then listening to great music. Those are ways you're going to start to build your your understanding and start to recognize some of these patterns. Um, let's look for another question. Um, really good question from Silvio. Uh, Lippy Demos. Hi, Lippy Demos. You're always, you've been here since the beginning. Appreciate you. Um, that is a great question. How often are you conscious about your pocket during recording and playing live? Does it often just happen for you or is that on top of your mind? I think more often than not, this is something that isn't necessarily consciously thought about or communicated between band members, just sort of happens. Um, not always, but usually. I find myself mostly responding to the drummer's vibe. It's like a dance, like every drummer's different, every song's different, every groove's different, and I am very closely paying attention to what the drummer's doing um, and then just kind of vibing with it. So all of this academic stuff that we're talking about, like you learn all this stuff so that you can forget it and in the moment just flow. That's usually my mind in the moment. Um, and based off of what the drummer's doing will determine where I stretch or sit in time. And I might not necessarily really be thinking about it, but by taking the time to do the things we talked about, right? Building your own rhythmic interdependence and listening to a lot of great music so that when you are in the situation, live or recording, you can, uh, you can execute it without necessarily thinking about it academically. That's the goal, right? We're trying to get to that phase of, of, unconscious uh just flow that's the that's the state we're all trying to get to great question um jim thank you really love your channel and i feel like i'm hanging out with an old friend every time that's so kind and i like hanging out with all of you so i feel very at home in this chat and i'm just i'm glad everybody's here um Alan, I agree. Listening is so underrated. Put the instrument down so you can be fully present. Yes. That's something that I talked about in this video I posted this week about I, I had a last minute fill in situation on a gig. And I think that uh, listening without your instrument in your hand is really efficient to internalize a song. Because you're not like, what's that note? You're not like finding it. You're focused on the song itself, which is like your true north. That's like the Polaris of everything you're supposed to do is the song itself. If you listen to the song without your instrument, you're going to understand that song better. So I agree with you, Alan. Really good questions here. And good observations. Um, okay, 
I'm going to jump back to the to uh, the topic at hand, the pocket thing, and give you two uh, homework. Let's not think of it as homework because homework's lame. Two quests. That's more fun, right? Two challenges to unlock your potential rhythmically. Um, these are not mine. These are pretty canon universal exercises that a lot of people can tell you about. Uh, I might not actually do them, but I'll tell you how to do them. So the first one is two and four. So for example, instead of having a, you, you can get your metronome. Maybe I should do it. I should do it. I'll do this real quick. Just bear with me because I have to like create a click track. Uh, stand by just a second. Um, can you hear that? Okay, there's a quarter note. Okay, nice. So that's, what BPM is that? Hmm. Pizza time, pizza and project. Okay, that's 80 BPM. Two, three, four, one, two, three, four. So I could practice with that and be like, super lame that's like academic but I was gonna right that's one way to practice but what if I cut it in half so we make it 40 instead of 80 so now that subdivision is cut in half and we'll assume that those beats that we're hearing on the metronome are beats two and four and it kind of is a mind trip at first to figure out how to feel it and count it. But just pick one of these beats and call it two, and the next one call it four, and then you can find one. So two, three, four, one, 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 two, right? So what that does, that's like an old school jazz thing. And I feel like I did a a really anemic version of <laughs> this concept because um, I'm multitasking here. But if you do that, and the goal is make the metronome groove, right? If you can sit with a metronome on two and four, then it's the backbeat and that reinforces your confidence in the one. So that's an exercise that I think is great. And sometimes I'll do that. Actually, I remember a few years ago, I did um, some music for Backstage Live, which was a thing my friend Rhett put on, which was a live broadcast thing during COVID, where we did a bunch of, like, I was in a band with some heavy hitters, um, and I wanted to come, and we didn't really rehearse that much. So if I knew roughly what the song was, I would put on a metronome like this, a two and four situation and practice the grooves to the songs so that I, I really wanted to come in and just kill it. I wanted it to be really solid. So that was a way that I prepared for that gig was by taking the grooves and removing subdivisions to build your own internal clock. Um, so that's one exercise. You can do that for anything. The other is similar but you can keep removing subdivisions. So like, let's say we slowed it down to 20 instead of 40. And so we only hear one click and we say that's beat one. And every time beat one comes around, it's that click. So what you're doing is you're building your subdivisions. You're building your internal clock. You're, you're filling in all the gaps and Every time one comes around, you try and nail it. And then what you can do is you can continue to slow that metronome down, and then you're dealing with beat one every other measure or every four measures. And there's actually videos of like Victor Wooten doing this where it's like, like, it's like, I don't know, 30 or 40 seconds between clicks. 
So it's like how strong is your internal clock? So that's a way you can start to build that muscle. So those are two ways, the two and four on the metronome and the removing beats on the metronome. And then also, like I said earlier, listening, really, really listen. That's the key, in my opinion. Really listen to music, listen to good music with good pocket. So those are some tips on how to grow your pocket. I would love to know some of yours. And um, also, if you weren't here earlier, one week from today, Friday, 27th, 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, I'm going to do a live workshop, Creative Baseline Building Workshop. The link to that is going to be in the chat here. And um, the code, there's a code for 33% off community. Excuse me. So you can join that class at a discount. That's why you can support this channel and also come hang out. It'd be fun. Also, if that's not your speed, I do have pre-recorded class, Four String Fundamentals, also 33% off code community, all caps. And I'm going to post a link in the chat here. So that link there will take you to both of those courses. And um, the code is community because community is important to me. And I want to grow community with you on this channel. I love doing this, by the way. Like, I started doing YouTube, and I'm like, I don't know what to expect. And it's, I love music so much. I love connecting with people. I love trying to help people. I mean, I don't know if I'm actually helping people, but I love trying to share what I do know. Um, I don't know everything, but I really enjoy this very much. And I enjoy making videos for you. So thanks for supporting me, supporting the channel. I'm going to take some more questions. I'm going to jump back into the chat here. Um, and also, tell me where you are. Where are you in the world? And what's your daily driver bass? What's the main bass that you're playing? Oh, and I should say, too, this bass right here in my hands, giving this away. It, if you're in the U.S., sorry, I have to pay for the shipping. Uh, the contest is in the description if you want to win this bass. And there are scammers in the chats. Don't listen to them. It's going to be announced on a live stream next Thursday. I will email the person that wins. I will not message them. I will not be in the comments saying something. There's someone that is lying and saying that they're me, and I keep deleting their, their comments, and they keep coming back. So don't be deceived. You will get an email if you win, and you don't have to pay for shipping. But you have to be in the U.S., unfortunately, to win, <laughs> just because I'm paying for shipping. I want to be very clear about that. So, um, wow, Madagascar, awesome. Slow is hard, make it swing, I agree. Yes, someone says, my friend always tells me to keep practicing with a metronome, but it is so hard. It is, it's not the funnest thing, but you can do it in a way that can be fun. Like, even if you just like, Put it on on your phone and just have it going throughout the day and just like you don't have to be playing but just like listen to it and it's almost like when you're driving and your turn signals on and you can like make little grooves with hearing the turn signal in your mind it's like anytime you're listening to a grid a rhythmic grid and like interacting with it you're building your rhythmic vocabulary and also your uh, interdependence thanks um so it doesn't have to be lame. I know it can be. Some of these exercises can be difficult and challenging and not necessarily fun, but they're things that are good to work on. Um, so looking through the chat here. Uh, I never owned a PB base, T40. I know they're heavy. How do you like it, Brando? Canada. Jim, welcome. Um, Ryan, I'm glad I've, I've helped your bass playing. I'm glad that you're playing this bass in my hands. Um, I'd love to do some more backstage lives. And Sylvia, I didn't realize you were in Germany. 
I'm glad you got the JMJ. Man, I did the that video last week with the and the black JMJ. I kind of fell in love with it, and I, I had to send it back. It was a little bit heartbreaking to tape the box shut and put it in the mail. Um, but I still love this blue one. This has been great. Oh, also, this is fun. I have a I have a surprise here. This is something I'm borrowing from my friend Rhett. This is not a bass. And it's not a guitar either. This is a bass six, baby. So cool. So it's like a guitar that's bigger and it's tuned down an octave. It's really cool, it's really fun. I'm still getting used to it. I think I'm gonna do a video about it soon, if you want me to, <laughs> but it's just a cool instrument. Uh, like Rhett was saying, it's on a lot of classic recordings, a lot of Beatles recordings, Glenn Campbell, Cream, a lot of stuff that people know and love and assume is an electric bass, and it's a Space Six. And I love it with some spring reverb and some tremolo. Uh, all right, I think I've kind of completed my like pocket lecture. I'll recap it and then we'll just open it up for any questions and we'll hang out for a little bit. Uh, if you're just coming in, we're talking about the pocket. I talked about the four levels of understanding of the pocket for the recap. So the first layer is just how's your timing. The second layer is how do you sit in a groove, which has to do with the three T's, your sense of timing, your sense of taste and your sense of tone and all of those three things together will determine if you're sitting in a groove your taste being your decision making your maturity of choosing to do something or not to do something in a way that sits in the band that's your pocket that's usually what it means when people say how's your pocket can you sit in the groove can you make the band groove or are you making the band not groove it's based off of your ability to keep time and your decisions and your tone. The third layer is how you sit in time itself, having to do with the metaphor of the canoe. The example being the band, our members of the band, they are sitting in a canoe going down a river. And the canoe is going at the same speed down the river, but one of them is ahead and one is behind. So you can sort of sit at different places in the canoe as a band member sitting ahead or behind the beat. Sometimes this is genre specific, sometimes it's individual specific, but being aware of it is cool. You can start to learn to do that by listening to music and practicing uh, your sense of time. And then the fourth uh, level of understanding of the pocket has to do with stretching time itself within a measure. It's a more, um, it's becoming a lot more popular I think in the last 10 years, stretching time where you're displacing beats. And it's usually most noticeable when drummers do it and bass players can kind of jump on with drummers i'm not going to give too many specific examples and then the two ways to improve three ways to improve your pocket one is uh listening listening to great music with great pocket two the um the first metronome exercise being cut your subdivisions in half and assume the notes that the metronome are striking our beats two and four, and then you can start to build your uh, your confidence in the one and build your subdivisions. And then the next, try removing more and more subdivisions and try and keep your internal rhythmic clock going. See if you can put the metronome at 20 BPM and play a groove and come back and hit one every time 
and keep reducing that metronome speed more and more and see how well you can keep time in the in-between. Uh, so yeah, those are the, the, the pocket things. Let me know any questions you have. Yeah, the basics is a vibe. Um, yep, Wichita Lineman is one of my favorite songs. And it is very bass sixy. Um, okay, great question from Puck Jones. Gotta confess, I'm super bass six curious. Do you think it's more of a novelty or something worth exploring before mastery of four string? Um, I think if you're interested in it, you should try it. I think uh, I'm still getting to know this instrument, but I do agree with what, what my friend Rhett said. He did a really cool video about the bass six, this one that I'm borrowing from him. And if I remember what he said, it's not a bass and it's not a guitar and if you like it's i think it's cool if you already have those things and get those things because it's somewhere in between um i wouldn't it's kind of a niche thing i think if you were gonna have a bass or a bass six i would probably say have a bass it's way more practical whereas the bass six is like a very niche sort of sound or something that you might could use to double the bass tracks in a mix or something like that. Um, same thing with guitar. It's like, if you're gonna play guitar, I'd have a guitar. But if you're into production and creative arrangement and you want that sound, this is a really cool sound that is kind of hard to fake. So I would say this is for someone that is really specifically interested in this sound and maybe has a direct application for it like a recording arranging context um, or if you're playing in a genre of music that's like like if you're playing outlaw country or you're playing like some cool old western style stuff like this makes sense um, but it probably wouldn't be my daily driver unless I was like deep in that music but it's really cool it's really fun you should try it maybe it's your thing you know, I'm just saying it might not be the most practical thing. <sighs> Do you recommend practicing with a click or pre-programmed drums in order to develop an internal clock? I think both. I think both. I think um, some drum practice tracks are super lame. <laughs> um, I think good loops are a way that you can start to practice that stretch time thing I was talking about. There, there are some great loops out there um, where you have some really funky drums that are stretching time. And you can start to internalize different feels by practicing with drums, but practicing with the metronome is kind of like eating your vegetables to grow your rhythmic strength. They're both helpful. I think you can learn things from both of those things I'm not going to tell you to just do one or the other. I think practicing with drum loops is way more fun. Um, and you learn different things from that. So I would say do both. Um, hmm. There are your questions in the chat. And then I think we'll, we'll wrap it up here soon. This was kind of like a surprise live stream because I'm trying to like dial in this whole system. Hmm. Ooh, okay, great question, Ryan. Ryan asks, uh, how's the Bronco mod coming along? Well, to be frank, not much is happening yet. Been busy. It's right here, and it's still in its unadulterated form. Still got the sticker on it. You know what? I think I should ceremonially remove this sticker with you in the chat. This is my base now. I got this to do that video. I decided I wanted to keep it. So now it's officially mine. Uh, I haven't done anything to it yet, 
but this is going to become something different than just a Bronco. If you don't know, these Broncos, this pickup size, this is the exact size of a Strat pickup. And actually, I have a theory. I think this is just a straight up Stratocaster pickup. Um, this is designed by Shay asks, what's her name? I think her name's going to be Liz. I think this is going to be Liz. Liz isn't herself yet. We have to unlock Liz's potential. Um, but what I was going to say, this pickup is... Uh, it's a strat sized pickup so you can like just straight up put a strat pickup in here or something that is strat sized so there's a lot of options to upgrade um, so I have a few ideas for this I also really want to work on the neck because like I kind of hate the neck and love it at the same time like it's easy to get around on but it also is like fighting me a little bit so I think I need to dial this in a little bit so I think this is a video that I'm hopefully going to do here in the next few weeks. I've just been, just been busy, but I'm really excited. Like this is a video I really want to make. So stay tuned for that. And also I should say, um, if you weren't here earlier, I need to remind myself to say these things. One week from today, Friday, October 27th at 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, I am going to do a live Zoom class, and I'm really excited about it. It's gonna be a creative baseline building workshop, uh, and there's a 33% off code for that workshop. And uh, if you wanna check that out, the link is in the chat. I'm gonna paste it, paste it here. Sorry about the sound. Um, also in the chat is a link to my base course, pre-recorded course for string fundamentals. It's about a two and a half hour base course. Um, and there's a 33% off code for that as well. All caps community. And uh, those are two ways you can genuinely help this channel. Um, okay, I'm getting back to the chat. Yeah, somebody called this geriatric salmon, which I think is hilarious. I think this is a sexy color. Like, I saw it on the website, and I was like, that's actually kind of cool. I kind of like, it's like coral. It's not quite pink. It's kind of like almost orangey pink. Um, I'm thinking about the pickup. There's a few options that I have in mind. Let me know what you think. <laughs> Nancy says Liz is currently still Elizabeth. Yes, well said. Um great question how do guitar and bass pickups differ um well one of the main reasons people assume that first off i don't think you have like you can have a guitar pickup on bass and it can sound fine i think this is a guitar pickup um i think this is a straight up strap pickup but a way that you can tell on a lot of pickup designs is the poles like there'll be uh six poles inside little magnets that are designed to sit with the string centered on the strings. So it's like if you have like a four string instrument and there's a pickup in there that has six poles, it's like, okay, I think that's a guitar pickup. That's one way you can tell, but there's no rules that say you can't do that. In fact, a lot of people chose this bass in the blind shootout against some basses way more expensive with way nicer pickups. And I have a theory that, um, how good something sounds doesn't necessarily have anything to do with how expensive it is. And also, uh, how good something sounds in a mix is way more important than how something sounds by itself. There's a lot of great songs. And when you start listening to the ISOs, the instruments don't sound great, but then when you hear them in the song, they sound amazing. And that's what matters to me. So sometimes you can have a bass with a cheap guitar pickup and it can punch way outside of its weight class. Um, but yeah, I'm planning to change the pickup out. I'm planning to change the pots. Um, maybe some 500 K potentiometers shield. This maybe a little better. I have an idea for the pickup. It's a little outside of the box. I want to do a lot of work on the neck. I might change the tuning pegs. 
And this is where this can kind of go off the rails real quick because it's like, okay, by the time I put all the money into this to do all those things, it's like, well, I could have just bought this base, which is good to go for the same amount of money, but it's not as customized and it's not as fun. But I will say this base I'm giving away for free and the link is in the description if you want to check that out. Um, but yeah, I think like Broncos are kind of a sleeper base. They're like, a lot of people think they're lame, but I think they're kind of cool. You just, they're not all great. You might get a lemon, but I think um, there's definitely potential if you're willing to tinker and work with it. Um, quarter pounder might be cool. I'm catching up on the chat here. Hmm. I'm just so glad y'all, y'all all are here. Maybe one more question and we'll wrap it up. Um, so throw your questions in real quick. Day three of trying to get an answer from Philip. I don't know what that means. Um, so if rain, let me know what your question is. Cause I'm not sure what the question is. Um, well, three questions in the chat may or may not do one more, but, uh, stay tuned for this build. If you want the base, the Mustang, the links in the description, if you want to hang out next Friday, the link to that is in the chat as well. Oh. Oh, okay. Uh, thank you, Design by Shay. Efrain asks, Hey, Philip, what do you do when you are in a musical setting where you aren't very familiar with the style or sound? What do you try to knock to do practice first? Okay, um, thank you. That is a great question. I'm sorry I missed it earlier. So I think, again, I think the, the theme for this live stream and maybe every live stream I ever will do is is listening is everything. Um, different genres of music have different expectations and you have to understand those expectations. Um, and the only way to do that is to listen and to understand. So if you are going to do a gig, immerse yourself in that style of music. Uh, I'm reminded of a few years ago, actually this is one of my favorite gigs I've ever done. I'll tell you a quick story. Maybe we'll end on this. Um, and then we can all go back to our Fridays and I hope you have a great one, but I'll give you an example. Uh, there's a bass player that I really admire named Brandon Gilliard. He's a great bass player and he, uh, he's a friend of mine and he, um, he was the house bass player at Ebenezer Baptist church in Atlanta for like nine or 10 years. Um, and if you aren't f familiar with that, church that is dr martin luther king jr's church because dr martin luther king jr was from atlanta and um, i was asked to fill in for brandon at dr king's church uh, on a wednesday night prayer service um, i don't want to talk about religion a lot on this channel but that was a special honor to be asked and that's why i'm bringing this up um, but the thing is in like traditional church and African-American church culture like that. You don't necessarily get a chance to prepare. So what did I do? I was like, okay, I'm going to show up and I don't know exactly what's going to happen. Um, what I did was I found a, actually a YouTube channel, which was like the Southern African-American hymnal and I just listened to like dozens of old recordings of hymns. They were just piano and like harmony. And I practiced for the gig by listening to those hymns over and over again, not trying to memorize the hymns, but trying to memorize the changes in the sort of patterns and the sort of figures. Because every style of music has its own vocabulary and sort of like patterns 
And what I was trying to do was to internalize those. Um, certain chord changes that will happen or certain turnarounds that will happen and certain th and every genre has its its own like identity of of musical things so to prepare for that gig I listened to a bunch of these old hymn recordings and played along with the piano on bass just to get the changes under my hands and then when I was when I showed up for the for the service um, I was able to I mean, I won't say I did it perfectly, but I, I was able to play in an appropriate way, in a supportive way, and I was honored to be there. That was one of my favorite gigs I've done, um, to be there at that place and like get to play for this prayer service for some of the folks that were there. The prayer service were older folks that probably marched with Dr. King in the 60s. Like, So I really, I really especially wanted to do... A, a great job. I always want to try and do a great job, but that gig or that, I don't even want to call it a gig, that service that I was asked to come and fill in for, I wanted to really honor that. So that's how I chose to prepare. I think that was the most effective way for me to prepare because I didn't have a set list. Uh, so the point, the moral of the story is if you are going to show up in a Musical setting where you aren't familiar with the style, immerse yourself in the style, listen to it a bunch before you even pick up your instrument and then start to try and recreate with your instrument what you're hearing. Start to memorize the patterns, and the things that make that style unique. And it always comes back to listening. So um, that I think is gonna be that's going to complete the live stream for today. I'm so happy you hung out with me. I'm so glad that you're here. And um, I hope you find whatever you're looking for with music. And uh, if you're still here, ways you can support this channel, check out the live class next Friday. Zoom link. Um, the link is in the chat. The code community all caps will get you 33 percent off that's a way you can support this channel and also if you want to win that base the link is in the description as well so thank you for being here and uh, i'll be back live on thursday to announce the winner of the giveaway so thank you for being here and i'll hopefully see you next week <laughs>